Now, the definition of an inverse function um, is just like if you have some value 2 comma 5 that belongs to your function, so that's an ordered pair. We're saying that for the input value 2, you get the output value 5. For the inverse function, we're guaranteed to have the ordered pair 5 comma 2 belong to uh, my inverse function. And the notation we use to talk about inverse functions is we use a little superscript negative 1. So whenever you see this, f with the superscript negative 1 of x, you would say that out loud. The way you would read it is f inverse of x. That's just denoting, look, we're looking at the inverse function. So all an inverse function does is it takes what we previously thought of as output values and then maps them to the corresponding input values. It does the opposite of what your function does. So you just swap. Inverse function swaps inputs and outputs. So based on what I've told you about this function f of x, if I were to evaluate f of 2, that should give me the output value five, right? That's how an ordered pair works, is I give you the input comma, the corresponding output, x comma y, for an ordered pair. So if I take f of 2 and I plug 2 in for the input, that's going to give me an output value of 5. If I were to plug 5 into my inverse function, so I say what is f inverse of 5, you would say 2. Yeah. And that means if I were to compose these two functions, like I say f inverse of f of 2, what would that value be? No. So I'm not multiplying, I'm composing these two functions. I'm saying what is f inverse of f of 2? Yes, you are right. That is 2. Again, for the reason because f of 2 is just 5. And so if I plug that in, I have f inverse of 5. And we just talked about how f inverse of 5 is 2. Likewise, what if I... Um, asked you what is f of f inverse of 5. Yeah, that's just 5. So whenever you compose a function with its inverse, you're always just going to get out what you put in, right? When you compose a function with its inverse, you're mapping that number to whatever number would be in the output, but then you're doing exactly the reverse operation you're, you're taking the inverse, so you're mapping that number back to what you started with. So in my case, we'll call this a uh, green circle. We'll call this the domain of f. And somewhere in my domain, we had the number 2. And this blue circle, we'll say, is the range of f. And so somewhere in the range, we had 5 because I told you that the number 2, whenever I did the function f to it, the function f mapped 2, the input value to the output value 5, and the way the inverse function works then is we're going to take 5 as an input, and then we map it back to 2. So whenever you compose the functions, you do both of them back to back. You're just going from 2 to 5 back to 2, or from 5 to 2 back to 5.
So that's the picture maybe you have in your head. Now the reason I told you that only one-to-one -one functions can have an inverse is because what if this function were something different? Like, um, let, me, let me actually just expand this. So let's say that f of x is equal to x squared plus 1. Then 2 squared plus 1 is 5, and so on. But what about if I had negative 2? If I did negative 2 squared plus 1, what would that map to? What does that negative 2 map? What did you say? 5. 5, yeah. Negative 2 squared plus 1 is still 5. So my function f maps both 2 and negative 2 to 5. So if I asked you, what's the inverse function do? Does it map the 5 to the 2 or to the negative 2? Uh, you know, there's not a clear answer. So that's why we say only a one-to-one -one function can truly have an inverse. 